All right, let's go ahead and get started. In the studio today, I have Danny Court. Danny is the partner and senior economist with Elliot D. Pollock and Company. He has a knowledge of economic and fiscal impact models relating to residential, commercial, and also mixed land uses. Danny also has experience creating and utilizing pro forma models for the acquisition and the valuation decisions that you might be making in real estate purchases. Uh, you know, his experience uh, has this uh, deep understanding of market data, um, pricing, sales velocity, costs, all these things that you need to put together to understand what's next for multifamily. Uh, this also allows him to appropriate or look at um, you know, pricing valuations and identify values in some of these decisions that developers are making as they, as they move in and out of markets. So with that, uh, I'd like to welcome in Danny Court. Danny, welcome in. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, awesome to have you back. Uh, yeah. I know that uh, a lot of people track a lot of the work that your team and uh, your group puts together to forecast. Uh, I, I never talk about what I don't know, and so I like to bring in people <laughs> that do. And I know you've got some great um, slides that you can take us through. Sometimes you just have to see the slide and visually tell the story. And uh, so let's start there. Yeah, yeah, and thanks for the introduction. And I feel like all the words you described is just that we're data people, and we just love data, and um, we just love it because it just tells the facts. So we present it. Sometimes it's a good story. Sometimes it's not a great story. But yeah. um, the the data we have here, um, some well, of me, it. Let me interrupt sure. for just a second before you get started on that, because you did mention the facts and the data. And that's one of the things that's important in, in getting to these deals is getting getting the emotions out of these decisions, right? And, and not just for the developer, but also for planning and city council and all those things to, to get these things in, in, into motion. Yeah, and a lot of our work, we do work with zoning attorneys, and a lot of our work is that element is let's bring some objective data into this because we've got some neighbors here saying... Everywhere I look, there's apartments going up when, in fact, you know, maybe this is a municipality that has just started building apartments and doesn't have that housing stock. So mm -hmm. we like to bring that in, some trends and history, um, and just show the story of what it is. So, yeah. um, you know, that's, that's what we do. And, and is that, uh, the, is that a being effective? I mean, are you feeling like um, it's, is it the community that needs the data or is it the city council? Who... Who needs that data, I guess? I think it's everybody. Um, elected officials and, and city staff is certainly a good recipient of it, and I think they're probably the ones that will maybe actually end up reading the report and, and getting that inside information. Um, sometimes they just don't have the resources to go and do that research. So when a developer can come in and provide, here's a third party independent study, um, here's what your market looks like, and, and here's what, you know, he, here are the facts. Um, a lot of times they end up appreciating that. On the, on the uh, resident side, you know, sometimes there are just people that just don't want to see development happen, right. you know, and, and it's going to be hard to convince them. You may be able to you know, change some hearts and minds with with that sort of report or data. Right. Um, but again, it's it's getting to the heart of um, who's going to make the decision, and you know, do they have all the facts in front of them? Mm -hmm. And so that's what our reports do. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take us through some of these things that you've put together. Yeah, and you know, last time we came out, we talked a lot about you know multifamily trends. You know, we're in the Phoenix area. That's what we specialize in. So this data is going to be a lot uh, you know concentrated on the Phoenix market. But again, it's replicable um, across the United States in a lot of markets. There's, right. This data is out there for each of these markets. Um, we are at a point in our history in the housing market that's we're basically at an un unprecedented time in terms of occupancy we have the lowest vacancy rate for homeowners and for renters and this is across the united states um, right here we have the u.s homeowner vacancy rate and then following right after the rental vacancy rate so again that you can see what happened during the great recession um, from the early 2000s that sort of we had this building boom oversupplied um, lots of vacancy and then the, over the next decade, we've basically absorbed all of that housing supply, and now we're short of supply. Hmm. Same thing that's happening in Arizona. Um, basically, a very similar trend. Uh, we're seeing it across the United, across the state, um, and in all the major metros. This both both 
both for sale housing and rental housing. Again, all time lows, very low occupancy. In the rental market, it's so low that we're saying it's beyond full occupancy. You know, a healthy market is maybe 7% vacancy um, for an apartment unit. That makes that means there's units available for a new tenant to come in if needed, if there's if there's demand for it, and there's enough there's enough rental units to be able to turn over some of those units and get them back out onto the market. We're now at 3% vacancy, you know, so we are well, really undersupplied. And this sort of tells the story here. We looked at housing units built by decade. Um, and again, you can see that in the 2000s, um, and this again is Greater Phoenix, nearly 500,000 units built in that decade. And uh, in the 2010s, 2010 to 2020, less than half that. Were people just cautious in the 2010s from... <laughs> Absolutely. And again... Recent pains or... <laughs> it, I mean, it, it, was a, it was a situation where we did overbuild. You know, so we did overbuild in housing, especially for sale, um, single family detached housing. So um, those units were being bought by investors, but not occupied by people. And so when there's no people to occupy the home, there's going to be an issue. Right. Um, now we've got those people. We've got 90,000 people coming to Greater Phoenix each year. They're, they're absorbing those homes and they've absorbed all of them. And now we're short. We're short of inventory again. And when you look on the horizon, we had we had less population growth during that time, uh, during the 2010s, but we had even less um, even less housing supply built for those people. You look you look in the next decade. Um, we're expecting nearly 900,000 people to come into right. this and, metro and that area. That number is trending up, right? I mean, yes, I'm hearing. Maricopa County is the number one growth county in the United States, according to the U.S. Census. We expect 85 to 95,000 people to come here every year. Um, and so when we already don't have any supply for them, we're building, basically annual building is, hap is the, the annual amount of development is happening just for those folks that are coming in, but we're already short of supply. So we, we wanted to be able to dig out of this hole, but we've got so many people coming here that uh, the the construction industry doesn't seem to be keeping up with that. So this is a recipe for potential, again, affordability pressure if we don't meet the supply, if we can't get that story told with the right data into these yep. markets to open these up. Plus, we're already seeing you that mentioned too. something to me earlier about um, uh, the completions too, because you have other factors to actually, I mean, there's one thing to have a pipeline, but then there's what's getting completed. Talk to me about that and how does that impact? Well, and I don't know if we, we included that, but yeah, you're, you're right. And um, we're seeing a capacity issue where um, there's a huge pipeline of development. So there's a ton of investor interest. There's a ton of development interest because they're responding to demand. Mm -hmm. They want to respond to that demand. Um, but what we started seeing in 2021 was permit levels started increasing rapidly, but completions were not. So there just became a widening gap, and it's still that it's still very wide. Usually, you uh, you issue about as many permits as you complete. It's about a one to one. You could mm -hmm. sort of bank on that. But now the uh, elongated construction timelines for a home or an right. apartment building, uh, supply chain issues, yep. labor issues, all of that. Uh, feeds into this elongated construction timeline process. So now, yes, we have the most units under construction um, since like the 1970s, but they're not getting completed. Mm. Um, that's what we want to see. We want to see completions. We want to see deliveries. And so um, we've even seen articles out there saying, are, are we at, uh, you know, is there an issue? Could we be overbuilding? Are we going to oversupply again? Or, or, you know, that is not happening. You know, there is interest. There are permits being pulled. Right. Um, there are things getting started, but they're not being delivered. Right. It's the wrong question. Um, hmm. um, again, this is just driving home the fact that, um, yes, there's a lot of supply coming online, but there's more people forming households. Um, there were so many um, millennials and Gen X living, living at home with parents that want to form a household. Um, just there's more household formations coming on. Um, just demographically, there, this, this just group Just in our of, own population, not, not even people migrating in, right? Just, yeah, absolutely. Just in our own population. Yeah, just and if, if... You have the boomers coming back into... into yeah, if, if you have adult children living at home, you, they have not formed a household. So, yeah, you have not increased population, but you're increasing households mm -hmm. when you do that. Um, and, and we're just seeing demographically, millennials is, is one of the largest uh, cohorts of, 
of population next to baby baby boomers. Mm -hmm. So as they start to come online and form households, they're going to create incredible demand for both rental and single family homes, right. rental and ownership homes. Right. Um, again, this is our, our short term outlook of Greater Phoenix employment. Really strong above average growth for the next two years. Every new employee, and we import a lot of employees, so when you see that big uh, Taiwan Semiconductors coming in, Intel's creating a $20 billion investment and they're going to create thousands of jobs. Um, these electric car manufacturers that are coming in, thousands of jobs for them, a lot of them are imported. They're, they're new people to Arizona, um, need a house, need a car, yeah. demand all the, all the new retail and, and restaurants. Um, so it all feeds on itself and creates this ripple effect. Are you guys talking effect. to them? I mean, are they, 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 I imagine they're looking for markets that they can get talent, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. so I'm sure Phoenix has been a great competitor for that. I mean, in any market, they're looking for talent. Are, are they also considering or even calling you to figure out, you know, where are they going to live and, and what, is, what does that look like before they make it a massive investment like that? So that's our, um, that's where the, the consternation of do you ring that bell because we've had so much economic development success. Mm -hmm. um, the metrics they are looking at is, like you said, how many, how many people within a 25 minute commute mm -hmm. of these potential sites. Right. Um, well, we've got a million people in, usually within right. a 20 minute commute. Um, so good labor pool. Um, low cost of living has been an attraction that is starting to erode in our market. It's, it's eroding in a lot of markets, but right. in Phoenix, it's eroding a little bit quicker because but of the affordability But it gets to the issue. point where it erodes so much that that regulation comes in. That's what we're trying to avoid, right? Yeah. I mean, that's... And so, so one, one quick example is um, uh, Lucid, who is an electric car manufacturer mm -hmm. in Casa Grande. Um, they love the site. They love the location. Um, and the assumption, I think, was we create the demand someone will come in and fill in the supply. Mm. But they're now begging the city of Casa Grande for that housing. Mm. We need housing for our workers. We, we said we'd bring 6,000 people here. They need some place to live at the wages we're, and at the wages we're paying, they need some place that's affordable to them. And that yeah. means apartments and, and uh, entry level single family homes. And is that homes. sort of the strategy, strategy that we need to to get that, <laughs> that acceleration of- That's the whole key is, is <laughs> that's what we've been begging people is, you need to include housing in your economic development strategy. Mm. And um, there are some cities, some, especially in the West Valley of, of, of Greater Phoenix, that sort of get it. You know, they're seeing these large employers coming on the Loop 303, big manufacturing facilities, the Amazon's out there, a lot of, a lot of big names are out there. And they are very supportive of housing and, and bringing that in because they understand um, people spend where they live. And right. so we're bringing these employers in. Well, the only way to really benefit for a, for a city is if, the, if those workers actually live there, spend that salary in your town and, right. and create that local sales tax. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, again, this is this is just employment leads to population growth. So this is that even though, um, you know, in decades past, you could bank on 3% growth in Greater Phoenix. Those days are past one because we're just such a, a much larger metro than before. But even at 1.9% growth, uh, that's 90,000 new residents each year creating demand. Um, this was at an interesting chart. You know, this goes back to affordability. Um, we have uh, as almost as many adults living with a parent, 18 to 29 year old adults living with their parents since the Great Depression. So it's, it's both a, a problem and an opportunity. Mm -hmm. One, because of the affordability issue, even with a, a, a pretty well paying job, you may not be able to afford even rent um, in certain municipalities. Mm -hmm. um, and then if your goal is to eventually own a home, we're seeing 30% <laughs> of price appreciation. Yeah, see, so, yeah. you know, <clears throat> if a $65,000 salary last year, you now need $85,000 to afford the same exact home, same exact square footage. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the consequence of that is maybe you're staying at home a little bit longer. Um, and... Um, the, but the flip side of that is uh, those adults will eventually form a household and create demand, future right. demand. So this is a pent up demand where, oh yeah, 90,000 people are, are moving here, but we also have a lot of adults living at home that may want to form a household and create even more demand. Yeah, and everything else is going up for them too, not just the housing costs. I mean, seven and a half and percent inflation. Getting, 
from year, that kind of increase. <laughs> yes, if because you did, those businesses expenses are going up at, at the accelerated rate. Exactly. Yeah. If you did not get a seven and a half percent raise, um, your dollar is not buying yeah. the same amount of goods that you could last year. So, yeah, yeah it's it's certainly an issue there. Um, this I, we're going to go into the next few slides are just to to highlight you know, how little supply there is out there. And this again is Greater Phoenix. Um, you could probably replicate this for a lot of markets throughout the country. Um, just incredibly low supply. This is the month the month supply of listings. Um, usually we're, we're, we usually expect about 70 days of supply. We're at 23. Um, if you're looking for a house under $350,000, um, the long run average was about 50 day supply. We're at 10. You know, days. Yeah, 10 days of supply at any time on the market right now. Um, and then the inventory of new homes. Um, usually a new home builder will keep an inventory of homes ready to buy um, speculatively. That we usually see about 1,500, 1,600 of those homes, and there's only about 400 out there on the market. Apartments. Um, because of affordability, we are, we are expecting a shift from um, ownership to to rental. So mm -hmm. for an example, in Greater Phoenix, you could always bank on about 65% of people are owners and 35% are renters. Mm -hmm. On the margin, we see that um, pushing more toward renters. So if you were to take um, our population growth forecast, um, just baseline new people coming in, we need 13 or 14,000 new multifamily units every year just for new population. If you want to dig yourself out of the hole, if you want to go from 3% vacancy to back to seven, which would be a healthy market, you need 15,000 more units. So if you want to take care of that, five years of if you want to take care of it over the next five years, we need 16,000 units every single year right. um, just to dig yourself out of the hole. So when you see reports saying, hey, there are so many more apartments being built right now. We're, we're seeing the most apartments being built right now. Good, we need them and all, we need all of them and more. Yeah, we're coming out of a hole. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and again, back to capacity. We've seen two independent- where do, you, where do you get, like in other markets, how would you get to this data? So I guess, are you helping, you're helping other groups as well? Like yeah, people it, call you for that advising, you know? Yeah, in fact, we were just, um, we just um, signed with a, a major construction company who um, was doing a, a large scale project, mm -hmm. um, had a, an, an estimate last year, and we're talking in the, in the, in the range of like a half a billion dollar mm -hmm. type of project, um, who at, at first said maybe, maybe put an $80 million contingency in there for, for cost escalation. Well, they had to go rebid that three months ago, wow. and they're now $180 million north of, of their original bid yeah. and they said they cannot predict price escalation right now and so you know they've they've brought us on um, to look try to look at some of those metrics what where is inflation heading um, in what in what commodities do we front load some of our construction costs by taking materials if there's a dip in a commodity price like lumber or steel um, where's our labor going to come from um, if if we need this large scale of a project because we want now we want to accelerate because costs are increasing so much so right. can we bring in labor is there enough you know so there's all those questions are going on and so um, back to this chart we always are very transparent on our sources so um, this here a o e o that's a that's an Arizona government entity that that provides economic statistics and mm -hmm. forecasting um, each each uh, state, um, a lot of counties or even um, economic, there's usually a quasi-governmental group that will put out data like this <clears throat> that's typically publicly available, sometimes for cost, sometimes for a, a fee. Um, there are also national vendors of demographic data and things like that. you have the data, you need to know how to make a decision from it. Yes. And that's where you guys really know what, like... Look and that's here. where you may benefit. Yeah, that's where you may benefit from either someone that's like us. We're just in the data every single day, mm -hmm. and so it's it's quick for us to grab it out. Um, it's we we do presentations like this to help interpret them, or interpret the data for them, right? Um, and provide our own opinions. See, one of our sources here is Elliott D. Pauling and Company, so mm -hmm. um, that's where we come in too because we provide our own original forecasts. Um, you know. It, it's us making the decision whether to rely on previous is is historical data the correct barometer for for future growth or right. do we need to or or do we think there's going something that's going to change right. just like our owner and renter 
ratio. You know, we feel like renters are going to be increasing over time, and so you need to account for that. Yeah, I, th I feel like in the, the, the so many uncertainties now. I mean, before you could probably put a deal together and and do these things, some of these things even on your own, and use less data to to do these things. But now, I mean, you just mentioned that that proper or that portfolio having those costs escalate like that. I mean. How do you man? I mean, you can't make decisions. The, the oh risks God, on that, yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, during uh, during this problem, I mean, I don't know. I mean, these developers are taking all the risk. The um, there's so many pressures that we just haven't had previously that are coming to us, you know. Um, and uh, I, I, you, this is Phoenix. What other market are there? Are there things that you see here that are parallels to other markets that things didn't go well as a result like maybe some similarities well I mean I think we can we could probably skip ahead those would be assumptions just right? just a just a little bit um, you know this this is the housing opportunity index and it includes a, a number of, of probably well-known familiar uh, markets that probably many investors are involved in um, and these are these are competitors from to each other. Um, so each of these areas is competing for for these jobs, for these tech companies, for these manufacturers mm -hmm. to come in, um, competing for people and 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 labor and jobs, and um, and so again there is there's this data out here for all of them. This this is to to highlight the fact that this is 2015 and the housing opportunity index means how what percentage of of households in your market can afford the median price home and so again this was our calling card in phoenix um, and then you can see there salt lake and tucson even more affordable back right. in 2015 so it was it was a calling card hey come over here you can affordable. maybe you can maybe pay a little bit less in your wages to to your employees because it doesn't cost as much to, to live and work here and and businesses are still oper making decisions off that same assumption too I mean, oh yeah i mean san francisco and these other markets um the bigger cities are yeah. probably still feeling this they, this trend. Yeah, so and then take me through. <laughs> so, see, so see, here's a jump to, to the yeah. latest data. So here, you know, uh, um, you know what what we just Six, went to. Yeah, look at <clears throat> 44. But you see the overall numbers here, where we were at nearly 70 percent of, of households could afford the median price home back in 2015. Um, but look across the board. Yeah, we're beating out some of these places like Las Vegas or Denver or Dallas. Um, but they were in the 60 percent range, 55 percent range. So not only did we erode even quicker than those markets, but everybody has dropped yeah. so this is again data that can be used you know if you're in the Dallas market you saw that you saw that same trend okay we were at 55 percent five years ago now uh, now we're at 50 percent so there's an issue there too and look at the numbers at the far right of this chart the the Seattle San Diego and Los <laughs> Angeles and so yeah. that's what I'm saying with the looming affordability thing now what that's where regulation comes in right like where it's like hey yeah, watch. Go go look at what California is doing. Where they're they're actually uh, just introduced some legislation that's zoning by right. You can put whatever you want <laughs> on your property. So you could have a single family home in a single family subdivision, and the guy next to you decides, "I'm going to put a fourplex in there." Is that is that on the table in other markets? And it's on the table here in, in Arizona. Yeah. yeah, there is a zoning by right legislation that's introduced. I think it's. Not going, to, not going to pass. I think what they're going to do is um, punt it for a year. It sounds favorable, but it's. I mean, talk to us. Well, I mean, from layman's terms, yeah, it does sound like okay. If we need more supply, let's just reduce right. all the regulations so that we can someone can produce that supply. Um, I personally think that's a bad idea. Um, there's others that that say, yeah, let's do it because it'll increase affordability, uh, it'll increase supply, but. Um, it, it takes away uh, a local control. It takes away the, the power of a municipality to design their city the way they would like Livable to do it. And, working. and and typically there's pretty good um, there's a pretty good methodology of planning your your community and putting the correct mm -hmm. um, land uses next to each other with buffers and, right. and, and transitional uses and things like that. So when you take that away, there there could be some chaos. There, I, just unintended consequences could happen. Right. The, the general idea of reducing regulation to be able to increase supply affordably, um, that there's, there's no increased cost to be able to create more supply, great idea. 
um, that probably is not the right approach. That's sort mm -hmm. of the slash and burn approach. You, you had some ways to find other sites that maybe weren't traditional as, as multifamily. Are you still looking at those, those opportunities or do you recommend developers do that? I mean, I don't want to say teardowns and, and redevelopments, but are there rezoning or other ways to get to those numbers other than just land that's... Well, it's like, you know, it, it, it all sort of boils down to, yeah, one thing absolutely is if you could reduce the amount of time it takes to develop a property to get the entitlements, the zoning through a municipal or through that bureaucracy, that is an easy way to reduce the cost to a developer um, where he can pass that savings law. A, a developer wants to be able to provide it at the most cost effective, you know, they're gonna, mm -hmm. they're gonna take the market price, whatever the market's giving them, but to compete, if they can provide right. a lower cost product, and bring it in below market and be able to have that that competitive edge that they'll, they'll take it. Um, the other would be would be would be density, and so if density can be done in a in a quality manner um, that's attractive to the consumer, that that's an attractive housing product to the consumer. If that density, if if the density can happen, if they can increase density in an area, um, that that to us is is another solution. Yeah, I think about there's the technology to accelerate the development process, even reduce risks on labor in the way that they build them. I mean, we've been building cars indoors for many years, right? But yeah. um, we assembled these prop properties uh, on, on location and obviously the, the labor and the cost to all that. Already so many pressures in place to just get a deal done, um, make predictions, get your investors all their money in, in all the right orders. but. Are you seeing any technology that, I mean, you mentioned the, the entitlement and the city and the, and the counties and all that stuff. That's probably harder to control on getting things moved through. But on the construction side, there are some innovations that um, can shorten those development times and windows and things like that. Are you seeing people leveraging that or... I don't think we're seeing it enough, and so that's always that's always sort of an, just a, another. It's unknown. the last bullet it's like point. Why we, introduce a new unknown? And like <laughs> no, it's it's like it's it's our it's our hope and wish that there will be uh, innovations in the construction sector that we're just not seeing. We have not seen productivity increases per per construction worker in the last 100 years. Like yeah. it's just not happening, and and so yeah, I think it would take. Uh, well, we let just, me let me let me ask you this. So. I look at people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, which are unfair comparisons for most, because I mean, these are the two wealthiest people in the world. But they're trying to get the customer to pay less for things, right? Like they're trying to keep costs down and be efficient because they know customers are gonna wanna have lower costs of things. Uh, and in, in Elon Musk's analogy, it's like, you know, the electric vehicle with smart people, the largest automakers in the world, were like, well, we can't make them quick enough, affordable enough, whatever, and the batteries were, let's say, 600, and he got them, Elon got them down to 80, because he built the battery himself, or he thought differently about it, and um, had probably the capital and the DNA to take that risk, Yeah. right, and, um, which is hard, right, but in recapping yesterday's conversation, um, Micah on our team made some really compelling um, thoughts, and he said that somebody was asking Elon that question like about the 25,000, he's trying to get the car down to like 25, an affordable electric car. Yeah. Because you know, these things are expensive, right? And he's working towards that, right? Like, and us, we're like, our only option is if we get it built, like they have to pay this because of your what construction costs, costs went from 80 million to 180 or whatever it is, right? So someone has to pay that. And what was fascinating about what he said, he's, uh, what Micah said about what Elon Musk said was that when they asked him the question, they said, um, you know, how you, what's, why is it taking so long to get to that $25,000 car, what, whatever, the, whatever the, the question was pinged with it. And he said, that's the wrong question. And what he said was he was actually improving the value of the car, not necessarily focused on price. He's like, I'm trying to make these cars more valuable. In other words, like right now, all of the cars in our parking lots are sitting there. Mm -hmm. If he gets them to where they're autonomous and, you know, you, 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 you get to your work and your car's sitting there, now it's, your car takes off, it's a taxi, or it's yeah, like no, creating, it's putting money back into the customer's pocket instead of just thinking about price. I think that there's a lot of things 
when you mentioned innovations and in not only how we build them, but the whole business around it, that if we factor those levels, we can maybe pencil out new new pro formas, you know what I mean? Um, sure. So, and actually we have um, a gentleman on uh, later today, uh, actually just following us here, around sort of how do you get to those alpha returns? How do you get to, how do you look at the business differently? Uh, this is after it's built and you get control of it. But if you can't build them, you know, faster or uh, more efficiently, then um, the basis is so high, we're just going to continually have this higher price of things. Yeah, and, and it may become, uh, you may, it may end up becoming a crisis before that mm -hmm. ends up happening. But, you know, we, we have seen that, that, that construction technology um, start to try to come out, the modular building, the mm -hmm. build, you know, building in the warehouse and delivering to the site, things like that, the 3D model, you know, 3D printing, things like that. So um, just nothing has come large scale, right. um, fully adopted, but yeah, it, the construction industry is, um, uh, in dire need of that technology, to, you know, that technology disruption to be right. able to do it because our, our whole mantra, and this is me personally, um, we have turned housing into gold and I think that was the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, you may feel good if you are a homeowner and your home just increased in value 30% year over year. What a great investment you right. have. And you're locked in. Um, you feel sort of bad for the, but how do you someone get to that's it? not. You take on more debt or, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, housing to us should just be a durable good. You need a refrigerator. You can go buy a refrigerator for a pretty reasonable price or a TV or something like that. Housing, it's a basic need. It's a durable good. That's where we think it should mm -hmm. get to is can we get to a place where housing is treated more as a durable good than yeah. as your entire retirement nest well, egg of yeah. where your wealth is coming from because right. now there's incentives to keep it that way. Well, there's some movements around where people are. You know, before, you would you could take on a 30-year mortgage and work in Albuquerque and work for Intel and plan that out and retire and that whole thing. But the way that people are working now, especially with the work from home and mm -hmm. flexible work, all these things that, um, in many cases, that strategy doesn't play out for the customer as much as, or at least doesn't sound as exciting. Now, the affordability rushes in and it's even more problematic. Um, but it's just interesting to me to, to see that, um, you know, the, the shift in expectations as well, like memberships, even with subscriptions, the automobile, automobile. I mean, you have people that used to buy cars and hold them and then, you know, I mean, the classic cars are yeah. that way. You know, they, they just have a passion for them and store them and stuff. But for me now, it's just like, I just always have a car payment, at least. Like, I don't even, you know, but I always have a, a car and... That's it. Like, I'm not trying to, you know, hold it and save it and, you know, sell it for a higher value. And I don't know if homeowner or your, co if it's renting or buying, that that ends up being your, just, you just plan on having this payment, whatever it is. Yeah, what's, and then the, I'm, what's the difference? Between I'm in Hawaii this own? week and I'm, I'm here and, you know, so uh, anyway, that's uh, something I was just thinking about. Uh, Carrie, did I just see a question or no? It's not showing on my, where, where is it? Okay. So, um, yes, it's a company. Oh, Eric, here we go. Eric says, uh, we agree, construction tech is lagging. Obviously, um, a lot of opportunity there, though, I think. Um, and he says, on, uh, and we're doing something about it in project management, collaboration, estimating areas of the space. So, yeah, I think that there's some innovations around organization, project management, as, as he's talking about. Uh, I'll have to check out that skillhop.com. But uh, it's even in the materials and the labor. Like, where, where are these, the majority of the costs? I look at Elon Musk, we looked at the rockets, and it's like, well, what does it take to build a rocket? That's how they got to, like, let's not blow them up. Mm -hmm. We've been blowing these things up, right? Yeah, so let's reuse them. <laughs> maybe if you just, if someone came there with first principles thinking and says, well, what does it really take to build this property? And it's like, well... You know, yeah, we were. What we, is it? <laughs> we were brought. Um, we were brought an apartment proposal as an investment opportunity. Um, they brought us a pro forma. The pro forma blew us away because their construction costs were so low, and so our You're ears, like, nope. our ears picked up. Like either this is where you've gone wrong, or 
you've got something here, right. some sort of technology, you're doing something with concrete forms or you right. know, something where, um, and the design, the architectural design was actually quite impressive in terms of being able to sort of cut and paste. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he had one building that you could put in f configuration. So that was really smart. Um, but then we came back and questioned him on the, on the construction. How are you able to do this for such a low price? Because if you can, you're, you're, yeah. you're, about, you're on to something here, and this is going to be something that, that we want to be able to repeat repeatedly throughout mm -hmm. the country. Um, it was just a promise from a contractor, mm -hmm. when, and when asked to confirm for an actual bid, it came in 40% higher, and that ruined his mm -hmm. entire performa. So again, it was just like, oh, wow, there's like, but, but there should be something. Yeah. There should be something on the horizon yeah. that can disrupt that and say, you know, because we... If you want the private sector to build uh, workforce housing, so think of someone that makes less than sixty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. um, how do you build to that? It's it's almost impossible right now. Most of the apartments you see from the private sector are in the quote unquote luxury segment. Yeah. Um, in Phoenix, it's you know it's well over two dollars a foot in in rent is what they're you know what they're targeting and even higher. Um, how? Could could you create a product that's that's a dollar a foot in rent mm -hmm. or a dollar fifty that that you can actually make money on, and that's you know that's been the big hope is that with without government subsidy, is there can there be a technological disruption that right. can create affordable housing? Well, that's a good point, and because we need not just new. I mean, you need all you need student housing, right? You mm -hmm. probably need um, the all different asset classes, not just all new class A luxury leasing, right? Yeah, that's, exactly. That's what's maybe penciling out, but um, it's across the board. And that, and it's in the big. That's where the biggest gap is. Um, the only reason that people are in housing, if they're not, you know, if if they quote unquote can't afford it, they're just overextending themselves. Some people spend over fifty percent of their income just to just on their monthly rent, mm -hmm. and so those people technically do have homes, um, yeah. but those are the ones most in danger of. Um, you know, pending homelessness if, if rents continue to rise because, you know, they're just making it work, um, overextending themselves just to be able to make that rent payment. But then in the next uptick, um, you know, rent increases again and they're out of a home. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't afford that. So um, it, th that's where the biggest need is, is, is in that affordable sort of sector. Yeah. Did we get through everything we wanted to cover here? Yeah, you know, we can quickly go through. Um, you know, we've we're starting to see that increase in interest rates. Um, so this was again another thing. Okay, if we're affordable now, but um, this chart here says, what if your price continues to appreciate? And so, what happens to affordability if your home prices go up five, ten, fifteen, and twenty percent? You see that that erosion. Mm. And this is at three and a half percent mortgage. We're already seeing um, rates tick up above that. So when you go to four percent, you know it, it it gets even higher. So those are the two things sort of battling affordability right now is one we've got just price appreciation because there's no supply um, and and tons of demand and two we've got this these interest rates that for 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 so long have been at rock bottom and there's nowhere to, for in, interest rates to go but up so you can pretty much bank on that that yeah, it, if there's movement in interest interest rates it's going to be going up mm -hmm. um, and we're already starting to see that so um so again, diminishing home. What are what are what are people <clears throat> underwriting right now for that? On the safe side, I guess is it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you, we're not we're not on the underwriting yeah. side. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, when you get an, when you get a report out that it, and it inflation's. It's it's persistent, and mm -hmm. so there was so much hope and so much optimism that okay, if the supply chain were to just resolve itself, somehow, <laughs> no one said how that's going to resolve itself. But if it were to resolve, we'll see a interest, uh, we'll see inflation go down. Um, it's it's staying here, um, and part of it is because of housing. Housing is included in that inflation mm -hmm. factor, so the housing cost increase is part of that inflation factor. So, um, <clears throat> you know, we do expect inflation rates to be much lower than they are currently but only because they've gone up so much prices have gone up so much so you're at this higher base we don't we don't see those prices coming down that's mm -hmm. that's for sure um, I think this goes back to something we were talking about before is um, you know 
what happens to rent if you know we can't fix this this supply issue um, so this is again a lot of numbers thrown out here but um, even if you were to start increasing your supply of housing uh, over and above the, the demand, we still anticipate price increases to continue. Um, it's not going to resolve itself overnight, so it could take a few years. Um, so even right now, um, in 2021, for, to afford the average rent of about $1,500 in Phoenix, you need about $60,000 income. Um, over the next five years, we see that going up to $74,000, even with uh, new supply coming online. If you didn't fix the problem, if you just have chronic undersupply at the level we're seeing right now, um, that you, could increase as high as the 2021 numbers catching up from 2022 number? I mean, obviously at 24%, was that, that's got to be nationally leading, right? I mean, that's the... Oh, it's one of the it's one of the national leaders, and that number is actually a little bit dated. We're closer to thirty percent. Right. So yeah, it's it it basically matched um, mm -hmm. homes. The rent increase. It was like pick your poison. You know. You, right. It was like oh okay, Everybody's. I can't afford a home. I'll just keep renting. Well, the rent went up thirty percent right. as well. So you know, again, the, this is this is again one of our forecasts: is if you don't take care of this problem, um, if if people don't step up and start to increase the supply, uh, you know, let municipalities let let these quality projects go through. Um, Other than find wanting to fix the problem, um, are there any? What else can we be doing? I guess. I'm, if if you had the answer, it would be fixed, right? But like, I don't think anybody has the answer otherwise. Well, right? if, if you are a member of your city, a member of your community, yeah. you could actually come and go out to your uh, city council meetings and advocate for, for a housing project. That's a little bit hard to do because it's so hard to... Um, navigate to government websites. To their arrows and oh well, yeah, you, you have to be willing to you know take a Thursday night, take your you know your busy night and and go down there. Um, but you know when when I'm attending a, a city council meeting, the only people that do show up are opposed mm -hmm. to a project, right. and so there's a feel in the room that this Everybody. represents my community's mm -hmm. desire. And so it's overrepresented by just a small vocal minority of people that, you know, not in my backyard. I don't want to see any growth. I don't want to restrict my views. Right. And they're talking about a vacant piece of property that will be developed, but it hasn't been. And so they get some unobstructed views, you know, so something will get built there. Right. They would rather just have nothing built there. And so there's no rationality to it. It would be great to see a couple of just regular folks, hey, I'd love to see this. I, it out. You know, I know there's a housing issue here. We need more housing here. Um, maybe there's a little bit more traffic in my neighborhood because of it, but we want them here. We need mm -hmm. this supply. I want my children to be able to have a place right. to be able to live, Where you know, <laughs> something like Based that. Based on this, uh, they're going to have to make a lot of money. Yeah, and it's it's already here. So we're just on this precipice of, of sort of an affordability crisis of mm -hmm. what, what do you do because... Uh, realistically, wages cannot increase by that much, um, so we're not going to see it on that side. So, what what is going to be the solution to that? Mm -hmm. um, it's it remains to be seen. But um, you know, just look at all the all the pain points. Um, labor, you know, is there again as a, a person or a, or a community member or just a citizen or a voter? Um, how much power do you have to influence any of the decisions? Um, not a lot, but mm -hmm. together as a group, you know, if you make your voice heard on, you know, we do want, you know, we do want a, a smart, uh, thoughtful uh, worker visa program. You know, we want to be able to mm -hmm. thoughtfully increase the supply of labor for these trades to be able to get this housing that mm -hmm. we so desperately need um, because we can't find it. We're not finding it domestically. Um, so, you know, it runs the gambit. But um, and we do also have there is some. Um, some optimism that that there is still a persistent supply chain issue that that hopefully can resolve itself, you know, as we see healthcare technology uh, vaccination, you know, just becoming ubiquitous and mm -hmm. being able to have a, a safe working environment so that everyone can be at full capacity. We're yeah. still seeing um, factories not at full capacity. We're still seeing disruptions at the ports um, and in transportation. Um, it, we have a shortage of truck worker of, of truckers and uh, transportation and distribution. So, you know, all those things are pain points that that drive up the cost. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure 
people are not exiting in terms of transaction. Maybe you're not a developer, but they're not exiting um, transactions because they can't find another one to go into. So finding the deal to to acquire is, is complicated as yeah. well. Yeah. All right, let's see. Um, again, we just love uh, data from every single point, and so we just, we just try to just um, pound in um, from every different angle, but this is just again, just a 12-month trend from what happened in 2020. Um, these are different occupations: nurse, police officers, firefighters, all the way to teachers and, and down. Um, what what could they afford in 2020? <clears throat> and um, when you get down to the lower end of the of the pay scale, you really can't afford anything if you're just a single earner in a single, um, you have a single income, a single earner um, at the lower levels, you know, basically less than $45,000 is hard to afford anything here in the Phoenix market. Yeah. <clears throat> but as you work your way up the, the pay scale, um, you know, <clears throat> it takes uh, up to like th the salary of, you know, seventy to $80,000, which is a police officer or a nurse that could afford to buy a home in a lot of the municipalities throughout the, throughout, uh, throughout Phoenix. Um, the, the color scale here is, okay, green, you can buy something. Yellow, you can rent a two-bedroom apartment. Orange, you could rent a one-bedroom apartment. And red is nothing. Um, so just more red. And <laughs> so yeah, w one year later, look how much red has has um, has creeped into this chart, <clears throat> and so it's affecting workers. And and again, this is. Um, these are sort of like well-known occupations. This is like the workforce, essential workers, and things mm -hmm. like that. But you could plug in any type of um, you could type in type in a software developer or um, a starting engineer or something like that that maybe maybe making sixty or seventy thousand dollars. Like they're in the same boat um, as all these others. Is okay. I I've now graduated from college. Mm -hmm. I I make sixty thousand dollars and I go out there and I still can't find anything. I can't afford anything. Right. Um, and so it's it's an issue. Um, so that's our, those are our conclusions here is, you know, <clears throat> especially this is again, specific to the Phoenix market, you know, we need 20 or 25,000 more single family units than we have today. So every year when we build, we need to be building more than the underlying demand of those 90,000 people coming here every year. We have a 15,000 unit undersupply of apartments, meaning- That's that five year catch up. Again, meaning if you build 13,000 units this year, we're still 15,000 units in the hole. And if you build 13,000 units next year, we're still 15,000 units in the hole. We need, we need to build above and beyond underlying demand to be able to work ourselves out from that hole. So that's that's basically what we've seen. You know, affordability has just fallen. It's it's plummeted. Um, we're we're sort of on that precipice as, of just like um, there's just it, it's going to become a crisis level mm -hmm. for for us to address because just what at what wage can you afford it? And you know, it's basically the haves and the have-nots. If you've if you've purchased a home, you're now gaining equity in those price appreciations. You can now move laterally or move up because mm -hmm. you've gained that equity. If you haven't entered that home market, you know you're you're in that have-not category of you know do I get in now? Is it going to go back down? We don't see that happening. Yeah. This is not the great. This is not a bubble. Um, there's no supply out there. Before we were building fifty to sixty thousand units a year oversupplying the market and people were buying them and and you know propping up those prices and there weren't any people so then it crashed we have no supply there is no supply out there right now yeah wow well this has been amazing um, thank you for for doing all this putting this together this has sure been thing. incredible for our audience uh, I know we could probably spend even more time on it um, any final thoughts you want to leave our viewers with uh, before we wrap up no, I mean the the opportunities are are amazing right now. Um, it, it's probably you know like you said, maybe there was a developer out there just working out their gut and it working out, but now it, now you need a data source. Mm -hmm. um, the data certainly helps. Um, I think it's still working out for those people that are just going off their gut <laughs> right now. But you know, at what land price? You know, the land prices are increasing rapidly too. Um, with the with the expectation that they're going to see that appreciation later, you know, are those trends going to continue? Things like that. But um, we welcome um, we welcome that development to this community. Um, we think it's a there's a great need for it. Um, there's a great need for advocacy to to support right. new housing, <clears throat> and we'd love to see um, that that technology breakthrough to to be able to 
really supply the market with what it needs. Yeah, that's great. Um, how can people get in touch with you? Um, we have a website. Uh, the shortest URL we have is edpco.com. Um, we also have arizonaeconomy.com that you can go to. Um, you know, I can leave my contact information behind, but pretty easy to get a hold of. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, again, thank you for coming on. This has been refreshing. Uh, so much great data. And you, you guys always do a great job explaining it because it's not easy to talk about these slides in many cases. Well, thank you. Because, uh, you know, sometimes pe you can fall asleep talking about <laughs> data. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you do a great job of using the data to tell a great story. And, and you know, out of this, I'm thinking, you know, leadership. It sounds like we need leadership. And we need to, I mean, if every developer, operator, management company just said, hey, you know, employees, you know, our, we, our industry is in need here. We know we can help people, and we know we, if we did, we could get more affordable housing for them. And we need to go to those city council meetings, advocate. Um, are there resources? Maybe we can kind of do a follow-up for everybody. Just sure. like, here's, a, here's what you should, here's a little script. Go to your city council meeting <laughs> Form and, and tell them this. You know, let's, we need more supply of labor. We need more housing and, and maybe just give them kind of like a, a cut sheet. Yeah, um, I'd be happy like to do that. that. So, um, yeah, appreciate you coming in. This has been amazing. And uh, hopefully we'll be just meeting you, meeting you again, maybe at the next summit, you know? Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Awesome.